Tonight, I'd like to take us on a journey through time, a journey deep into time in Earth's history, back to when Earth was doing some of her most amazing experiments. We're going to go on a journey through almost four billion years of Earth's history, back to a time when there were no dinosaurs, there were no plants, there was no photosynthesis, oxygen hadn't evolved into the Earth's atmosphere for animals to be created. There weren't even any cells yet, no bacteria, no cellular life. I want to take us on a journey back to a time when if life existed, it was life as molecules. And I'm going to tell you about the kinds of molecules that we imagine were the first kinds of life on Earth. They're called ribonucleic acids, or RNAs. And RNAs, as molecules, could be considered life if we consider a very, very simple definition of life as follows. That life would be something that could replicate and do so in a reasonable amount of time, say hours or weeks or years, but not centuries or millennia. So if life is a system that can replicate in a reasonable amount of time, then it's possible that life could be a set of molecules. And tonight we're going to go on a journey through time back to Earth's history where probably RNAs were the molecules of life. Now, if that's possible, that life could be considered a molecule, I think that that's a really interesting idea to think about. But to me, an even more interesting idea is that not only were these RNAs, which I'll introduce to you in a little bit, around 3.8 billion years ago, they've also made the reverse journey all the way through time to today, where RNAs are present in all cells on Earth, every single cell in your body, every single microbe, plant, fungus, you name it. And they play an absolutely central role in life today. It is absolutely the most important role in life, and that is to decode the DNA genome into what makes us human, what makes microbes microbes, etc. To decode the DNA genome into what is life today. And that role is played by these amazing molecules called ribonucleic acid. I think it's really interesting to think about the idea that molecules could be life, that those molecules could have stayed on Earth for 3.8 billion years and be in life today, in all of life today, and not only are these molecules still in our lives, but unlike fossils etched in stone of beautiful organisms that have since left the face of this planet, these RNA molecules have embedded themselves in the most important function of cells, which is decoding the DNA genomes. So to go on this journey tonight, 3.8 billion years, that's a long time, and it's an interesting concept to grasp such deep time, let's try to do it. I have a friend who's a geoscientist who was asked to come and teach about dinosaurs to some second graders, and he was excited to do that, and he knew he'd have to engage them in thinking about time. Now, dinosaurs lived about 100 million years ago, nothing like the billions of years we have to think about tonight. But my friend said to the class, now tell me, what is the oldest thing you can think of? And a boy raised his hand and he said, my dad! <laughs> It was a hard way to start that lesson. We'll see how we do tonight. So again, I'm talking about molecules that decode the DNA genome to make all of life today. And here's a little microcosm of some of life, including some current Williams students. And we're going to talk about Earth's history here. So about 4.5 billion years ago, Earth was formed, and a billion years it took for life as we know it today, cellular life, to evolve. Then we'll see some more familiar markers. Photosynthesis happened almost a billion years later. That created a, an atmosphere that could support the lives of eukaryotes, like these beautiful yeasts. Of course, then metazoans developed, much more complex organisms, dinosaurs, the humanoid lineage. And finally, in 1953, we end this timeline along with Williams. But the 1953 point is the discovery of the beautiful double helix structure of DNA, our genomes, by Watson and Crick. All right, so we want to go back to this point between microbial life and the formation of Earth, 
where the RNA world existed. If, as I am suggesting, the theory is correct that the first life on Earth was really a set of molecules called ribonucleic acids, those molecules came into being before cellular life and, as I've said, are incorporated into all of cellular life in all of life's history. So what you're asking, what is the story with this RNA world? Why would people hypothesize that such a molecular world of life existed? Well, the theoretical background is that RNA is the only molecule known to us now that has the two basic properties needed for life. And those properties are that it has to retain and store genetic information. And RNA is a ribbon-like structure like DNA that has four bases in it. It's got an alphabet of four, G, A, U, and C. And it can retain that information from one generation to the next. RNA also can catalyze reactions. So this is what's different about RNA, is the word and in between these two things. It can store genetic information and it can catalyze reactions. Catalysis just means making things go faster in real time. Replication in a short amount of time rather than waiting for millennia to happen. Now DNA, our genomes you know, is a great storer of genetic information, but to date we have no evidence that it has a catalytic property. Proteins, which is what ultimately DNA needs to encode to create life as we know it today, are fabulous catalysts, much better than RNA, but we don't have any knowledge of how proteins can store genetic information. So theoretically, RNA is the molecule of life that would have started out life on Earth prior to the formation of cells. Now you might want to ask, what other evidence do we have besides theory? Okay, good thoughts, makes sense. How about some physical evidence for the existence of an RNA world 3.8 billion years ago? Here is the physical evidence for that RNA world. <laughs> there is no such evidence, nor will there ever be. RNA is an inherently unstable molecule. There is no way it's going to last billions of years. In fact, there's almost no way it lasts in my students' laboratories. I tell them that if they look at their RNA in their test tubes cross-eyed, it might degrade on its own. So be very, very careful. RNA is a very unstable molecule, so we're never, ever going to have physical evidence of this RNA world that I'm telling you about. So what evidence do we have? Well, scientists have been trying to concoct RNA molecules that have the properties of the theoretical RNAs from this ancient RNA world. And in fact, in the last decade, many people around the world have been able to create RNAs in test tubes and have those RNAs create other RNAs in that same test tube through in vitro evolution experiments to create RNAs that can replicate themselves or that can catalytically replicate other RNA molecules. So we have evidence today from laboratories that this kind of world could exist. For me, the best evidence for this world existing is the living evidence of an RNA world, as I've already intimated to you, that today we have RNAs that translate our DNA genomes into proteins. And that's what I want to spend the bulk of the rest of my time talking about. How is it that RNAs in our current world, our world, microbes' worlds, plants' worlds, every cell in the Earth's world, how is it that RNAs do their work in, tr in decoding the DNA genome to make proteins, which make everything happen? Okay, so here we have the DNA genome again. It needs to be decoded by these ancient RNAs, and I'm going to talk to you about three types of ancient RNAs that work here in concert. The goal is to make proteins. Now, those pictures of proteins don't tell you about the amazing diversity and functionality and creativity of proteins, but proteins do everything that creates life. So the proteins create a cottonwood tree from a nearly invisible cottonwood seed. They create humans, yeast, microbes, butterflies, and the plants that they interact with. And how do those proteins do that? Because proteins form structures that create cells, that allow cells to communicate with one another, to tether to one another, to get away from one another, to resist one another. They create tissues. Those come together to make organs. And those organs come together to make some of our favorite species on planet Earth. Now, that's what proteins do. They do everything for life. And so now we want to consider how does the DNA information, which is just a repository of information, 
get to be proteins, and that's the story of these ancient RNAs that live in all cells in the world. So here you see between the DNA genome and proteins, we have some RNAs called messengers, messenger RNAs or mRNAs. Messenger RNAs, as you see, are ribbons that look like DNA, but they're single-stranded ribbons and not that du double helix. These contain very similar information that the DNA contained. But here's an ancient RNA molecule that's starting to do the DNA decoding. How does that work? Well, there are another two RNA molecules that bind to the messengers and read their messages. Not only do they read their messages, but they translate those messenger RNA codes into protein codes. Those two ancient RNAs are called ribosomal RNAs, or rRNAs, and transfer RNAs, or tRNAs. And again, these read and transfer the RNA information into a protein code. Now, to illustrate this better, I'm going to show you a two-minute film that will show this process of these ancient RNAs present in all life on Earth decoding the DNA genome as they, as they do through the messenger RNA. To set you up for the film, here are the players. There's a golden ribbon at the bottom called messenger RNA containing the four letter alphabet, not very sophisticated, four letters that contains all the genetic information needed to synthesize a protein. Then the rRNA, the ribosomal RNA shown here in lavender and blue is a big factory, and inside that factory is a catalytic core that connects the amino acids shown in red, which are the building blocks of proteins. So amino acids have to come into the factory, the ribosome, get catalytically attached to one another, one after another, into a long polymeric chain, and that will become the protein. How does that happen? Those amino acids come in by virtue of those pale green blobs, which are the transfer RNAs. Transfer RNAs are amazing decoders. They have the ability to read the messenger RNA message and to translate that into an amino acid to build a protein. So let's go forward and see this film about how these ancient RNAs create proteins in all cells on Earth. Here we see that golden messenger RNA swirling around and coming out of the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, a cell like us, or like plants or fungi. And it's coming into the cytosol where translation happens. Here's the factory. This blue ribosome in two parts is mainly made of ribosomal RNA, an ancient molecule. Into the factory swoop our transfer RNAs, another ancient molecule. As you see the ribbon of messenger RNA being pulled to the left chugging through the ribosome to read the transfer RNAs. Each transfer RNA has a little red amino acid attached to it, and that's what it's transferring to the newly made protein. Each of those little red shapes is different to illustrate the differing chemistries of the amino acids. Those chemistries are going to give the protein its final form and function. Here's a peel away of the factory, an inside glimpse. You see the messenger RNA coming off to the left, transfer RNAs whirling in, depositing each one an amino acid that is catalytically added by the ribosomal RNA onto the growing protein chain. And that is how the genome, in this case, through the messenger RNA, gets decoded in every single cell of every organism on Earth. And out of this factory emerges the final protein which could be, for example, hemoglobin, that you're making in millions of molecules a second as we sit here so that you can actually use oxygen and get that to all of your cells. Hemoglobin is an example of a protein. OK, so here we've seen a story of three ancient RNAs that have been around for 3.8 billion years and are integrated into all of life on Earth. I think a good analogy of this is, is to think about something else that has made itself indispensable. And we know about that all the time in this time of high unemployment. Any employee who finds her company changing dramatically and is worried about her own position needs to make herself indispensable to that company's function in order to stay as an employee for a really long time. <laughs> RNA did exactly the same thing. Here it had its own happy world as molecules by itself doing life, self-replicating RNA life, such as it was. 
And then, we don't know how this happened, but the DNA protein world evolved. It evolved in the presence of those RNAs, of course, and not just in the presence, those RNAs made themselves indispensable employees of all of cells on Earth when they integrated into that system. So I think those are fascinating issues to think about. In addition, there is something generally about biology that always attracts my attention, and that is that I love to think about or to find the simple within the complex. And we've seen a great example of that here with these RNA molecules. Here are three very simple molecules, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA, that have been around for almost all of time on planet Earth, and they have embedded themselves into the complexity of life on Earth. In my own laboratory, we have considered the simplicity of one of these molecules, the transfer RNA molecule, and here you see it as a multicolored um, multicolored strand that has made a form upon itself that looks sort of like an upside down L. It touches the messenger RNA where it reads its code and it brings an amino acid into that growing protein chain. And on the theme of simplicity within complexity, we have been studying the complexity that's been added to transfer RNA in modern times. So transfer RNA doesn't just look like a linear RNA molecule that's folded in upon itself as is shown here. But in fact, there are many and extensive decorations of chemistries that are added to that transfer RNA. And my students, David Arnolds and Anna Brocious, examined how those chemistries that are added to transfer RNA affect its function in everyday life. And those arrows point to places that they found were required for tRNA stability. Take one of those decorations away, tRNA is fine, take any two away, and the tRNA absolutely falls apart. So we're looking at a new complexity within that simplicity of transfer RNA. Another complexity that we discovered through Jessica Ray's work in my lab is that the transfer RNAs have evolved an ability to talk to cell division. So we're working inside live cells, and those cells need to divide to stay alive, and transfer RNAs have a way of communicating about their chemical decorations to the cell division machinery to say whether it's safe or not to continue division. So that's a new complexity that tRNA has evolved over time. It's hard enough for me, as we think about going back billions of years, it's hard enough for me to imagine that I'm related evolutionarily even to some mammals, to think about how am I related to elephants or how am I related to a giraffe. But what's easy for me to see and to apprehend is the fact that all of life on Earth is connected through these simple molecules, these RNA molecules that are in the most central and important process of life, the decoding of the G DNA genome. And how simple is that? Three elegant, simple, and powerful molecules in all life on Earth from almost the beginning of time for our lovely planet. Thank you.